I'm the author of this book, Pinball Wizards, Jackpot Strains, and the Cult of the Silver Ball. I am in real life a biologist um, and a comedian, and uh, you might have seen me on the show Outrageous Acts of Science on the Science Channel. It's a show about co uh, scientists making fun of YouTube clips. It's a fun show, new episodes Wednesday nights. Um, but what I'm here today to talk about is something that has uh, very little to do with science or YouTube although it is on YouTube a lot, and that's Pinball. So this book uh, came out last November, and my own history with Pinball is that I grew up liking Pinball but not being obsessed with it. There wasn't that much of a, an opportunity to play it. I could play it at the beach. I lived in Delaware, and we went to the Delaware beaches once a year. And then um, when I got older, I would play it in bars and uh, go to a bar across the street from my graduate school every Tuesday night and play against a friend of mine. And then that same friend for my 24th birthday gave me, um, he paid my admission into one season of the Free State Pinball Association, which is the Maryland uh, Pinball League. I had never heard of a pinball league. I didn't know that such a thing existed. It never occurred to me to Google those two words. But suddenly, I was in one, and I saw just how bad I really was. Because I thought I was good at pinball, but then these people, I would see them like in, they, they would play multi-ball, and they'd catch two balls on one flipper and just play with the remaining flipper, holding those two balls in reserve. It was amazing. And so over the years, uh, this is 2003 I started there, uh, I just started learning from them and going to more tournaments and things. And at one point, I was ranked 80th in the world. Asterisk, this is before a lot of people had joined the world rankings yet, so I'm not that good but um, I put it on my resume anyway, just to try to fool people. And in 2011, I stopped going to tournaments and everything because um, my wife had a baby and she wouldn't let me. That was kind of it. So she said, that's it, you're not gonna be able to go to pinball events, you have to come help with the baby. And then three years later, she had another baby. So in 2011, until about the time of this book, I was kind of out of pinball, and then at some point, um, I've been talking about writing a book about pinball, and my wife said, you know what, if you actually write that book about pinball you keep talking about, you will ha you'll will you be able to go to uh, pinball tournaments. You'll have to. And that was enough motivation for me. Like, okay, clearly, um, clearly I have to do this. And so in the couple years it took me to work in this book, it's actually just over three years, I went to pinball tournaments, pinball museums, arcades, barcades. Um, I met the major manufacturers of all the pinball machines. I've been to factories. And I have now, it's to the point where I'm checking seven different pinball sites on my computer every day now, even though I'm still not back in a pinball league. So I learned a lot about pinball. There's a lot about its history. And um, what's so strange and interesting about it is that its most exciting time in its entire history might be right now. It's in a really interesting place, and we'll get to that. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the past, present, and future of pinball some of the more interesting stories from its history, and then uh, I'll take questions, and at the end I've got uh, copies of my book. If anyone would like to come and, um, and purchase, I can sign them and so forth, and that's the last I'm gonna try to sell to you obnoxiously, because I hate that. So this is what pinball looked like in 1932. Um, this game is called Ballyhoo. This game sold more than 50,000 copies. It was incredibly popular. The slogan was, what'll they play in 32? Ballyhoo. That somehow was enough to sell 50,000 of these things. And there's some things that you notice in this picture, some things that you notice are not there. Flippers, no flippers. Pinball looked like this. It had no flippers. It was um, more similar to something called Bagatelle, which is, if you remember those little like cheap plastic games you get from Chuck E. Cheese where you launch the ball and it lands in a little cup and that's about it, that's what it was. That somehow was interesting enough to people to sell so many of these. It was a tabletop thing made of wood. I think this one sold for something like $16.50 and people would put it in a bar, and it would collect coins. This is another one from the time. This is Rocket from 1933. Uh, it's a beautiful game, very art deco. This explains, this is a, a flyer advertising Rocket. This flyer kind of explains why it was instantly popular in the early 30s. Look at the lower left. There is that little box that talks about payout. Um, it can operate in open or closed territory. So payout, these things actually gave out money. And that's why pinball sort of picked up in the early 30s. It was de facto gambling in a way. So if you think about um, a modern pinball machine is kind of like a video game plus physics. A pinball machine of that era, era was more like a slot machine plus physics. That's all it was. Your balls would land in different saucers, you get different scores based on where it landed, and then you would get actual money coming out of the machine. 
Now, operating in open or closed territory meant that if you're a bar owner, you put this machine on your bar. If you are not allowed to gamble in this particular state or city or jurisdiction, they can just close up that door. Money can't come out. They can disable that part, and it can be there just for amusement only. This is how this company was able to sell this game all over the country, even though the laws about gambling were mixed. And those laws about gambling would actually send pinball into the back rooms for the next 40 years. So um, a lot of these games, if you think about it, uh, how, how different they might have been or not been from slots, a lot of these games were one ball games. You pay a penny, you pay a nickel, you get one ball, you launch it, you see where it lands at the end. And is that really that different from a slot machine? Not really. Um, they had tricks to evade the gambling police. Sometimes instead of paying out coins, they would pay out tokens, which you could then exchange for coins. Or they would give free plays after a while. Like right now, you get a high score on a pinball machine, you get credits won, you get a free game. That's kind of what they did that back then as well, except there's a little rotating dial that would tell you how many free games you won. But you weren't necessarily meant to play all the free games. You were meant to sell them back to the arcade owner. So you'd build up, say, 75 free games, and then you go to the proprietor and say, hey, I've got 75 free games. The guy presses a button, 75 goes down to zero, and he pays you for those 75 games. So that was gambling plus inconvenience. Um, in fact, a lot of these had tickers that could go up to 999 games, which should have been a signal to everybody that people were not meant to play all of these free games. They were really just winning money. Um, there was an arcade I read about from the 30s where they had a claw machine, you know, the kind where you pick up stuffed animals, and a policeman trying to demonstrate that they were gambling went in, played the claw machine, and won a small electric clock, and he said he was immediately approached by the proprietor of the arcade who said, I'll pay you 75 cents for that clock. So that's how they got around the gambling laws in many places. Um, and you can sort of see this from 2019 and say, well, duh. Of course it was gambling. How could anyone look at that and not say it was gambling? But if you think about it, is Chuck E. Cheese any different? Right? You're playing with money to get tokens. You get, put the tokens in to win tickets. You pay the tickets for prizes. It's just several steps removed. Okay, maybe that sounds like a stretch, but there's an article in Wired in 2015 about these guys called the Ticket Kings who basically have uh, their, uh, their day job is to play games at Dave & Buster's. 1,200 people in the U.S. make their living this way, going to Dave & Buster's, playing the games according to certain rules that they know well, winning lots of tickets, using the tickets to buy iPads, selling the iPads on eBay. These guys make $50 an hour this way. Is that so different from gambling just because there are three steps between the payment and the payment versus one step? So it's really hazy territory and nobody really stepped on it. Nobody said, okay, this is not okay until this guy. This is Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia of New York. He was the 99th mayor of New York and he came in with a very puritanical sensibility. This is the, uh, the mid-30s, and he said, let's drive the bums out of town. That was his famous radio address where he said, let's drive the bums out of town, which, unfortunately, implicates nonspecific bums. So he got rid of anything that offended him. He outlawed burlesque houses and smutty magazines and artichokes, believe it or not. Artichokes were outlawed in New York thanks to Mayor LaGuardia. Why? Well, it had more to do with allegations of mob price fixing, but I will grant you that if there's any such thing as an evil vegetable, it is an artichoke. Um, so he got rid of everything, and then how do you get rid of things? How do you step in and just say, now artichokes are illegal, and now burlesque houses are illegal? You do it through the Office of Licensing. If you want to have a pinball machine in your anything, you need a license for that pinball machine. So all he had to do was work with the Office of Licensing to not grant licenses for pinball machines. And that's exactly what happened. So Paul Moss, the head of the Office of Licensing, who was very, very similar to LaGuardia, basically agreed to stop granting licenses for pinball machines. And uh, then he extended that to not granting licenses for any place that had a pinball machine in it. And it went a little further than that, as you'll see in a minute. So um, this all came into the court in 1935. A man named Jacob Murawski, who owned a stationery store in the Bronx, had a pinball machine in his stationery store. He was shut down, told that he was operating an illegal gambling parlor without a license. And he said, but it's just a pinball machine, or a bagatelle machine, as they would have called it then. So they brought him into court, and he said, okay, I'm going to do something interesting. I'm going to prove to the court that this game, this pinball game, or the pin game, as they called it then, is a game of skill and not a game of luck. 
Because that's the big question. Gambling is luck, pinball is skill, this is a game of skill. So he said, all right, I'm gonna set up a pinball machine in the court, and I'm gonna have people who've never played before come play it, and I'm gonna have experts come play it, and I'm gonna show that the experts can outscore the regular people. So imagine how confident he must have been that the experts were going to outscore the regular people when pinball still looked like this. So um, he brought in the experts, he brought in the unskilled people, which were just the detectives who charged him with a crime, and the detectives and the experts scored the same. Pinball really was a game of luck in the 30s. And so the court immediately said, that's it, it's a game of luck, therefore it's gambling, therefore it's outlawed. That was the end of that. And there's proof that the game was very chancy. So the next year there was a, um, a professor at NYU who wanted to see exactly how luck or skill-based it was. And so he had test subjects play almost 100,000 games of pinball. And he did this with great academic rigor. And he showed that those who had some skill going into it were better than those who didn't, but only about two to 9% of the time. So yes, game of luck and banned. So Paul Moss goes from outlaw pinball uh, with a payout mechanism to outlaw all pinball to outlaw anything that has a pinball machine in it. And, um, and it, just, it just grew from there. And part of it, we can sort of look at it now and say, yeah, okay, it's because of gambling, but it's also because in the 30s, leisure was kind of a foreign concept. Now, leisure is such a normal thing that we have, we're in a convention about it right now. But at the time, this is the Great Depression. And if a man is gonna go spend his hard-earned nickel to watch a ball bounce around without payout, clearly there must be something wrong with that man. And if he's going to spend it with a payout, well, that's gambling. So that was it. It was unscrupulous, unwholesome, no matter what. Not just because it was frivolous, but because what is this leisure and how is it that people have time for it and how stupid is this? So, uh, like imagine a slot machine with no payout. How much fun is that? Why would people do that? So, um, this is what happened next. So as it went from not granting licenses for pin, pinballs to not granting licenses for places with pinballs, it went to revoke licenses for entire establishments to smash pinball machines in the street with a sledgehammer. This is LaGuardia posing for press photos, smashing pinball machines in the street. They were hauled out, smashed with a sledgehammer. This is a real policy. The 21st of January, 1942, this policy was enacted. Any pinball machine can be dragged out into the street and smashed to bits. Um, the wooden steel uh, made of uh, the pinball machines were made of were needed for the salvage for victory campaign in World War II. And so imagine explaining to a soldier that you're using their wooden steel to make a toy. So there's a lot of moral pressure on pinball to just disappear. Um, and in one case, he actually repurposed the legs, the wooden legs of about 2,000 machines as police billy clubs. It's hard to get more symbolic than that. And by the end of this campaign, he would destroy over 11,000 pinball machines, most of which are still today in the same place where he left them in the 40s, which is actually the bottom of the Hudson River. So I've always thought it'd be neat to you know, scuba dive there or something, find all the old pinball machines. They're probably not intact. Here's another picture that I like of him just uh, happily grabbing bunches and bunches of pinballs from pinball machines that he confiscated and smashed. So pinball went into the back room. It was not legal between 1942 and whenever it became re-legalized, which is what we're gonna talk about next. Now, I, I should also mention, this is just in New York City that I'm talking about, because it's the most clear example of pinball's progression from illegal to legal. The truth is, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, pinball's legal landscape was all over the map when you were all over the map. So you could drive through a state and go from a county where it was allowed to a county where it was banned to a county where you're allowed to just not have extra balls to a county where you were not allowed to have the launching mechanism but everything else was okay, which made it really hard for pinball manufacturers to make a game that would be allowed everywhere. So we're gonna jump forward 40 years. Uh, it's now the mid 70s, pinball looks like this, a little bit different. Flippers uh, came onto pinball machines for the first time in 1947 on a game called Humpty Dumpty. And even then they looked weird. It wasn't two flippers, it was six flippers pointing out in random unhelpful directions. But that was the first game that had flippers. And uh, at that point in the 70s, they had changed from gambling machines to toys. This is Captain Fantastic and the Dirt Brown Cowboy, an Elton John themed game from 1976. 
There might even be one of these in the arcade downstairs. I haven't looked yet, but after this talk, I'm going to go look. Um, and pinball is legal-ish in some places, but not New York City yet. So you would actually find, if you wanted to play pinball in the mid-70s, you'd probably have to go to peep shows in New York and go to the back room. And that is what Roger Sharp did. So Roger Sharp uh, becomes the protagonist in the next part of our story. He was a young writer. He'd written a couple articles about pinball because he liked pinball. He started uh, working on a book about pinball called Pinball! Exclamation point. Um, it was published in 1977, and he, was, uh, he had a lot of industry contacts, but no industry affiliation. So he was just this guy coming out of nowhere, grew up in Chicago, moved to New York, loved to play pinball, was shocked to find that it was illegal in New York. He actually had to go to a peep show just to play the game, and he would go to the back room, and then he showed up one day, and his machines were all gone, and the owner of the peep show said, yeah, they raided us, the games are gone. And so Roger Sharp said, what can I do to help? How can I bring this back to the front? Because it's just, at this point, a game. There are no coins tumbling out of these machines. It's Elton John, for goodness sake. Um, at this point, I mean, pinball at this point could even be, uh, it had the luxury of being boring. This is the stupidest game I've ever seen. This is Canada Dry Bitter Orange. This is a real game. It was a game made to promote not even Canada Dry Ginger Ale, but Canada Dry Ginger Ale's newest flavor, Bitter Orange. This is about, I'm only showing the top half of the play field, but that's all there is to it, pretty much. It's just targets to say Canada Dry. Um, so pinball was really changing and evolving, not sure what it wanted to be yet. I did see through the door that downstairs there's a Hercules pinball machine, which is the largest pinball machine ever made. Um, uh, there's a, a second one called Bigfoot that was almost made and is the same size, but it uses a billiard ball. Um, and so pinball is experimenting, trying new things. They even tried to put a camera on a game that would take your picture in 1979. Um, you know, like Polaroid kind of stuff. Never quite caught on. Um, and so at this point, people are agitating for pinball to become legal. And what they propose doing is the exact same thing that Jacob Murawski did in 1935. They're going to go in front of the New York City Council and prove once and for all that pinball is a game of skill and not a game of luck. And at this point, with flippers, it really more was a game of skill. So, May 13th, 1976, Roger Sharp goes in front of the New York City Council. They asked him to be the one to do this demonstration, to show that pinball is a game of skill. He is going to play pinball in a skilled way and show them all that he can control the ball. So. Uh, I've talked to Roger Sharp many times about this, and he says that it was amazing. He got in front of this group, and there was this anger in them. They were all ready. To, they just called them up, and they're like, so who's paying you to do this? What exactly is your goal here? Who's paying for your book? And he was just thinking he's just going to play a game of pinball. Suddenly, he had to defend an entire industry, and this was all resting on him. This is an actual photo of him playing pinball in front of the New York City Council while they look suspiciously. Um, and so the, the council was, was so paranoid that they brought him in to play a pinball machine called El Dorado, which he knew well, and they had a second game over in the corner just as a backup game. Roger Sharp steps up to play El Dorado, and then the council says, no, no, you're not going to fool us. Don't play that game. Play the backup game, as though there was something rigged about the real games. Then they had to wait while they got the game away and moved the backup game into place. The backup game was a game called Bank Shot. And if you, this is a, like, probably the most famous event in pinball's history. You might have read about it in little listicles online. They even did an episode of Comedy Central's Drug, Drunk History about this. And in fact, in that episode, they said that instead of the real game, they brought Roger Sharp a game that he'd never played before, which is over-dramatizing it and completely false. Roger Sharp says that he has played every production pinball game since 1966 and takes great pride in that. So he knew both games. What he decided to do was to show them Without a doubt, the pinball could be controlled. This is the game he played. This is, um, this is Bank Shot. It's a billiards-themed game. You can see there are different pool balls. They have different numbers. And in the top, there are those five lanes with balls one, two, three, four, five. So he plays a couple of balls. He demonstrates. You know, He says, I'm going to catch the ball on the flipper. There, I've done it. I'm going to aim for that target. There, I've hit it. And sometimes he hits, sometimes he misses, but he's always explaining it. He's two balls in. He's lost his second ball. and. The, uh, the city council is still not convinced. So Roger says, okay, I'm gonna take a chance. I'm gonna demonstrate to them that even the most random part of the game can have some control to it. And that part is not the flip, but the launch. 
the launching of the ball onto the play field by pulling back the plunger. So this is a magnified view of those top five lanes. The middle lane with number one happened to be lit. And Roger says to himself, okay, I'm gonna do something that will seem dramatic enough that it should convince them. So he says to them before launching that third ball, okay, I'm gonna launch that ball, it's going to go down the center lane, which is lit. Now, those of you who played pinball, which is probably all of you, know that that's not as easy to do as hitting a target or hitting a ramp from your flipper. You know, the, you only get a couple chances to pull back, that, uh, pull back that plunger. It's like a basketball player has many chances to shoot a basket, but not so many chances to work on the tip-off. So this is kind of like the tip-off of a pinball game. But Roger has some level of control, and he said that if he missed it by a little bit, then he'd be no worse off than he was, so what the hell. He launched it, it bounced off the rubber in the upper left, and then went right swish down the center lane. And he says that the person standing next to him in that photograph looked at him and said, we've seen enough, and that was it. Pinball was legal again in New York City. Um, June, June 1st, 1976, just about two weeks later, pinball became legal again and came out of back rooms thanks to that one lucky and somewhat skill-based launch. Um, it's easy to say that, uh, and a lot of listicles say this, they say pinball became legal in New York City and the rest of the country followed suit. That's not really true. The fact is, like I said, it was all over the place, legal, illegal, in wherever. In fact, when Roger Sharp did this in New York, pinball had already been legal in Los Angeles for two years. But this was a major dramatic event, it got press, and like I said, it's in all the listicles now as the one event in defi you know, defining pinball's history. It came back, this whole event has become so talked up and immortalized that it's a subject of an oil painting. This is an oil painting called He Called the Shot. Uh, that they, they now um, auction off at, uh, at various pinball events. In fact, this is Roger Sharp now um, with his two sons, Zach and Josh. He is sort of treated like a pinball demigod when he goes places, and rightly so. He actually still works in pinball. He was an editor at GQ for a while, but now he does, um, he helps pinball companies with licensing issues. Um, his two sons, one of them is the president of the International Flipper Pinball Association, the other is the director of marketing and licensing at Stern Pinball. So he's got a pinball legacy that is going forward and, uh, and there's some neat doc documentaries about him online you can look for. Okay, so that's the second story in pinball's history and the third, the really, really um, crucial one in whether pinball would live or die happened a couple decades later. Now. If you stop and take a look at what pinball is, it is, as uh, Jersey Jack, the, uh, the CEO of Jersey Jack Pinball likes to say, it is everything nobody needs, right? In this era in which we all have unlimited video games on a glass rectangle in our pocket, who the hell needs a 250 pound beast made of wood and steel and glass that you can't move, that can only play one game, that costs thousands of dollars, and uh, that has 3,500 different parts and half a mile of wire. What is this thing? Why does this thing, pinball, still exist? And that's kind of the question that pinball's been asking throughout its whole history. Because its history has been a history of almost dying. It almost died in the 30s when it was outlawed. And it almost died after that, after the arcade boom in the 80s. So. Arcades, as you know, huge early 80s. Pinball rose with them on their coattails. Pinball followed video games into arcades. Pinball was already in arcades, but then the video games dramatically increased the number of arcades, and pinball with them. And then suddenly, nobody liked arcades anymore because we all had video games at home, and they died. And then so suddenly, pinball started to come back. So pinball's history is a history of peaks and troughs. In fact, here's the way you can look at it. A pinball machine that sells really well would be a pinball machine that sells more than 10,000 of a particular title of a machine. Um, this is what Pat Lawler says. Pat Lawler is one of the famous pinball designers and he's designed three machines that have sold more than 10,000 copies and those are Funhouse, Twilight Zone, and Adam's Family. So if you look at pinball's whole history, all the machines that have ever sold more than 10,000, not counting the early ones like Ballyhoo, there are 41 of those machines. 28 were sold between 1975 and 1982, 13 were sold between 1987 and 1992, and none were sold during any other period. 
So pinball went huge in the early 80s. By 1983, it was dead. 83, 84, 85, pinball was going to disappear off the face of the planet. Then it slowly started to come back. 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92. It peaked in 92, and then it started to disappear again. That's kind of when I came into it. So a lot of people were trying to jump into pinball in the mid-90s, thinking it would be popular, but in some ways it was its own greatest enemy. People sold a lot of pinball machines in 1992, 1993, and suddenly they had them now and no one needed more. They were more reliable. They weren't breaking down as much. Many, many reasons pinball started to fade in the 90s, but it certainly did. In, uh, by the end of the 90s, there were only three pinball manufacturers left. WMS Gaming, which was also called Williams, Sega, yes, the makers of Sonic the Hedgehog, also made pinball for a while, and Stern Pinball. So whenever anyone asks me for like the one sentence version of my book, what I tell them is these are the numbers that explain pinball's history. In the 30s, when pinball was at its peak, there were 145 different manufacturers of pinball machines, 145. In 1980, when pinball was extremely popular, there were 23. By the end of the 90s, beginning of the year 1999, there were three, just these three. And um, not only that, but the, it was kind of imbalanced between them. Williams, the big one, they had 70 to 75% market share, and then the other two were just making a few games here and there. So um, it's a dying industry, and in 1999, Williams takes a look at what they're doing. Now, they're making games that we now regard as the best games ever, um, games like Attack from Mars, and, um, and uh, Tales of the Arabian Nights, and Monster Bash, and Medieval Madness, and Theater of Magic, just these brilliant games that everybody loves now, which is why they cost so much now. So Williams looks at their games, and they say, okay, we're the makers of the best pinball machines on the planet, we own three quarters of the market, and it still doesn't seem worth it to us. We would like to stop making pinball and start focusing on the other thing we make, which is, of all things, slot machines. If you've been to a casino and you've seen a cool slot machine that's like cartoon themed or something that's got all the you know, fancy reels, and that's Williams, WMS Gaming. That's what they were working on. So they said to their designers in 1999, look, you guys are all about to be out of work. We're going to shut down the pinball division unless you can produce something so new and so different that the world has never seen it before, and then we will save your jobs. So they suddenly had to change pinball overnight. Um, and what, uh, how do you do that? What is new about pinball? Well, 1999, what could you come up with? This is what they came up with. This is PB2K, Pinball 2000. Um, this is the first of the two games they made under this system called Revenge from Mars. It's a sequel to the 1995 game Attack from Mars. It's really hard to take a picture that explains exactly what this is. I don't know if there's one of these downstairs. If there is, take a look at it. But it's a slightly smaller pinball machine where you're actually playing through a hologram. So if you see the picture on the right, that screen is kind of mirror reflected in a very clever way, especially very clever for 1999. So it looks 3D, and when you're shooting the ball up a ramp, it looks like you're shooting it at a little holographic Martian who's in front of that ramp and squashing the Martian. So really neat. They brought this out, and they showed everybody, and everyone said, you've done it. This is new. This is nothing we've ever seen before. This is going to sell like crazy. And then it did sell like crazy. They sold over 6,000 of these, which at the time was a lot. Then the second title they put out, unfortunately, was Star Wars Episode I, and that sold about 3,000. Um, but it was selling what, like they wanted it to sell. And WMS said to them, uh, you know, the, the makers of the pinball machine said to them, thank you, you have revolutionized pinball, we're closing pinball anyway. And there are many reasons for that, and some of it is, um, though for example, this machine, as I said, came out in 1999. They looked at how this machine earned compared to other machines from 1999. So let's compare it to Sega's game in 99, which was South Park. South Park was a normal pinball machine. It's actually not even that much fun. There's not that much to do, but it's South Park themed. And they found that people in bars were paying just as many quarters to play South Park as they were to play this thing. And yet, the bar owner would have to pay a lot more to buy this machine than to buy a South Park. So in that way, it did not change the industry enough. And on October 25th, 1999, Williams stopped making pinball machines forever. 
In fact, there is Pinball Expo, the big annual meeting of pinball people in Chicago, the weekend before, and there's a whole transcript online you can find of Jorge Gomez, the main designer of this, one of the main designers of this, who talked about how they, they did it, and is it an incredible, and yet he's still nervous because he's hearing rumors. And indeed, when he got back to work on Monday, they brought everybody in the cafeteria and said, thank you, go home. So that is what happened in 1999. So at the beginning of 1999, there were only three pinball manufacturers left. By the end of 1999, there was one. That was it. One more left. And it wasn't the big one. It wasn't the good one. Sega sold all of their assets to Stern. So in 1999, as the millennium ticked over, there was only one group left making pinball machines, Stern. Now Stern scooped up some of the talent that had been fired from Williams. But even so, everybody in 99, I remember being a part of this doom and gloom, was thinking, that's it. Pinball is done. Who needs this? We have the internet. We would love for there to be more pinball machines in the world, but this is it going out, not with a bang, but with a whimper. Well, that would be the end of the story were it not for what happened over the next 15, 20 years. So Stern Pinball became the last company standing, um, the last dinosaur, as Gary Stern, the CEO, liked to say. And in 2008, 2009, Stern Pinball itself almost went out of business as well. It was the recession. Nobody could afford pinball machines. People were buying them like crazy in 2006. They had Pirates of the Caribbean, very popular game in 2006. And then suddenly, 2008, 2009, when they're making games like 24 and Tron, it just started to go down. Nobody was buying pinball machines because nobody had any money for that kind of luxury. Stern was about to go out of business when they hired a firm to sort of um, step in and kind of recalibrate things and come up with a way for them to stay in business. And without going into all the business reasons, which are in the book if you'd like to hear about them, they did it. They stayed afloat. They weathered the recession and came out stronger on the other side. <clears throat> but the reason why pinball has not died yet is not just that Stern stayed around. Now, that is a big part of it. They're the biggest manufacturer of pinball machines. It's because of these guys as, as well. <coughs> Today, there are eight pinball manufacturers. How did we go from 145 to, to 23 in 1980, to three in 1999, to one in 2000, to almost zero in 2008, to eight today? Um, <coughs> those are Stern, Jersey Jack, Dutch Pinball, American, American Pinball, Home Pin, Multimorphic, excuse me, uh, Spooky Chicago Gaming Company, and um, I should add the caveat that Highway Pinball declared bankruptcy last year, so I have to take them off the list. And more caveats, Dutch Pinball is having problems putting out their game, uh, Big Lebowski, which is a great game, but they're just having problems, um, some of which are related to the CEO's health. The um, Chicago Gaming Company is not putting out new games, but they are remaking old games that were popular in the late 90s. So you might play a Medieval Madness or you might play a Medieval Madness remake. Um, Attack from Mars, Attack from Mars remake. They just put out Monster Bash remake, which is a lot of fun. So suddenly what happened, starting in about 2013, is that these other little companies started springing up and saying, maybe we can make pinball machines too. Now this is so much harder than it sounds, and I found this out from talking to a lot of people. To make a new pinball machine from scratch takes at least a million dollars and a year of development, probably more. If you're a new company, maybe more like two years, three years, maybe more than a million. The reason is, it seems so simple to just sit down and design a pinball machine. Let's put a ramp here, let's put a target there at the end. But there are so many steps that go into it. 3,500 parts in a pinball machine and if you don't have them all, if you have 3,499 parts and the manufacturer of this plastic ramp protector can't ship you the plastic ramp protector in time, you still don't have a pinball machine. So some of these companies are, uh, I'm showing you the ones that are successful, that are producing and selling and shipping games. There is also a good number of them not on here because they were not successful. They took people's pre-order money People would pay $5,000 to pre-order a game, and then they went bankrupt after spending everyone's money and producing zero machines. Many different reasons for this. I tell some of these stories in the book, but um, for example, there's a, a company called Skit B that tried to make a game based on the, the movie Predator. They got pretty far in it. People paid lots of money for them to do this. They had plenty of reason to think that the people behind this company were talented enough to do this, but they never got the license for Predator. 
They just assumed they'd be allowed to do it, kind of, and so they got a cease and desist letter and suddenly they were done and they'd already spent the money, sorry. So a lot of people got burned on things like this and stopped giving money to pre-orders. The main, uh, the one that really blew everyone out of the water and actually succeeded first was Jersey Jack Pinball. This guy, Jack Guarnieri, who's the CEO of Jersey Jack Pinball, located in Lakewood, New Jersey. He said, all right, it's 2011, I'm gonna found a new pinball machine company, I'm gonna make a game with a theme that's going to appeal to everybody. The Wizard of Oz. Now, it's a very interesting choice because right now pinball themes tend to be uh, superhero movies and Iron Maiden and you know m music groups. He wanted to find something that would appeal to everybody, people, uh, you know, adults, kids, regardless. And he already had the license to make a pinball machine on Wizard of Oz because he had been the CEO of a of a company that made crane games and he'd worked at a company that did quarter pushers, and he got the license to Wizard of Oz through that. So he says, "All right, I'm going to make a Wizard of Oz game. People send me money, and I'll make your games." Then he starts missing deadlines. And he says, you're gonna have your games by 2011, by 2012, by 2013. Finally, in 2013, he actually gets the game out the door and things start picking up. He's selling more and more copies of Wizard of Oz. He makes a second game, The Hobbit. That starts going out the door. He makes a third game and a fourth game. Um, and somehow, Jersey Jack is able to finally be like the second biggest pinball manufacturer on Earth after Stern. A lot of these others have just made a single game and so we, it remains to be seen whether they're, the, they're gonna go out of business. Highway Pinball, whose logo I just took off of there, they made a game called Full Throttle, a motocross racing themed game, and then they went out of business before they could make their second game, which was Aliens, the themed on the Alien and Aliens movie. Spooky Pinball has stayed in business by trying to not dominate the competition. They're trying to just make a reasonable number of fun pinball machines. This is founded by a dad, Charlie Emery, who quit his job his wife quit her job. They founded a pinball company with the two of them, their teenage kids, and three employees, and that's it. They're in this tiny, tiny town of Benton, Wisconsin, population 973, and the town gave them a warehouse for free because they wanted to be the, uh, the pinball capital of Wisconsin, and so now they've got a free warehouse and three employees, and they don't try to put out 10,000 games, they try to put out 300 games a year, and they're succeeding at it. So they've got some interesting games. They've got America's Most Haunted and um, Rob Zombie's Spook Show International and then a Jetsons machine, which really didn't fit with any of their uh, theme and a Domino's Pizza game, which is weird. Um, so suddenly, the fact that makers can make is what's saving pinball. And I have to also add that it's not the only thing saving pinball because Gary Stern gets annoyed when he hears that. Gary Stern, the CEO of Stern Pinball, Everyone is saying, pinball is thriving now because of the little makers. And Gary Stern is saying, ahem, I'm still the one keeping the industry afloat with thousands and thousands of games a year, which is a good point. There is palpable animosity between Jersey Jack and Gary Stern. And uh, I ended up getting a whole chapter in the book to Jersey Jack after sitting with him for an hour and hearing his cursing about Gary Stern for an hour. It was fun. Um, they're both very nice people and they both make great games. This is what pinball is becoming now though. As these new companies are coming onto the scene, they're innovating, they're trying new things. This is Multimorphic Pinball, a company based in Austin, Texas. This is one of their games, Lexi Lightspeed Escape from Earth. And um, a couple different things about this machine from any other game. The flippers are modular. Fl flipper breaks, you don't need a soldering iron to fix it. You can swap it out and put a new flipper mechanism in. Look at the play field. It's not wood, it's a screen. So half the play field is a screen, but an actual physical pinball rolls over the screen. You can see vapor trails behind the ball or it's running over cars or whatever it's doing in the game. But behind that, at the top, is an actual physical pinball machine that it's interacting with. So it's a game that's about half pinball, half video pinball with a real ball. I've played one of these. Um, they're hard to find because they haven't made that many of them yet. I played one at a bar in Austin, it was awesome. Um, pinball itself is enjoying a renaissance. There are now more than 40,000 play players uh, registered with the International Flipper Pinball Association, many of whom are competing in this tournament downstairs. Um, there are at least 20 pinball museums in operation. And I don't mean mu museums that have pinball, I mean museums dedicated to nothing but pinball. 20 of them. Um, arcades, barcades, there are hundreds of pinball leagues around the country, thousands of tournaments. 
This may be the most technologically advanced pinball machine. This is dialed in. This came out in 2017. Um, you can connect your phone to this game by Bluetooth and flip the flippers using your phone, which is kind of gimmicky, but also really important for accessibility. So um, there are people who, who need different, uh, you know, I've, I actually sat in a seminar once about sip and puff technology attached to pinball. So the quadriplegics can play pinball with a, by sipping and puffing into a straw. So this goes a ways toward that. Um, this game takes your picture and displays it on the screen to distract you during crazy selfie mode. If you get a high score, it takes your picture and displays it there. So does his next game, Pirates of the Caribbean, which is a follow-on from, from Stearns, or maybe a reimagining of Stearns. So pinball machines are doing things that they never could before. And isn't it amazing that in 2019, we can talk about all these advances pinball machines are making. I mean, look in the back box. That's a 27-inch flat screen, not the little dot matrix displays that pinball companies were using in 1991. It's actually a modern-looking thing. Isn't it amazing that this exists as opposed to, and pinball died 20 years ago, and we're just playing the games from the 90s? So one last thing to show, this is, uh, I took a screenshot this morning of Pinball Map. Uh, it's an app, I use it all the time, um, pinballmap.com or the Pinball Map app. It will tell you where all the publicly playable pinball machines are in the area. Pinball still has an exposure problem. It may be more popular than it's been in the last quarter century, but when I talk to people about pinball who are not gaming people, they tend to say, oh, pinball, does that still exist? Are they still making those? Um, I heard someone say that at a, uh, at a car rental place in Chicago, and he lives in Chicago where the most pinball machines are. Gary Stern, CEO of Stern Pinball, told me that um, people were visiting his factory. They went to a restaurant one block away. They mentioned what they were doing, and the waitress said, oh, do they still make pinball? And they said, yes, there, at that building out the window. That's where they make it. So people don't know where pinball is. This is one way to find out. It will tell you all the places that have publicly playable machines. This is the D.C. area. In D.C., there are 35 locations with 157 publicly playable machines. Um, in a week, I'm going to be giving a talk at uh, an event for Atlas Obscura, which is the, uh, the website that talks about little-known hidden things. Um, so it's a talk about pinball at a very hidden and very new but very awesome arcade that everyone should visit if you get a chance. College Park, Maryland has Mom's Organic Market, and next to the freezer aisle... Behind a curtain is the largest pinball arcade in Maryland. You don't know that it's there while shopping at the, at the store, but the CEO happens to be a huge fan of pinball, and it's like his personal collection. Um, he has a place in Bethesda called Vuk that's got 10 machines as well, and they're great machines. So um, it's there. It's just hidden, and apps like this help show you where it is. So my hope is that even if you don't read the book, that you are inspired to go find a place to play pinball. So thank you so much for your attention. I really appreciate it. I will gladly take any questions that people have. Thank you. And feel free to just shout the questions. Um, we're not going to pass around a mic because there's like 20 of you. Well, don't all shout at once. So the, the question is when ramps first started appearing, like ramps, tubes, pipes, uh, the habit trails, the little metal ones, those, yeah, so those, you won't see those on machines from the 70s. I think those started around 1980 or so, um, and even then they weren't quite sure how they, they were going to be configured. Nowadays when they make a pinball machine, they'll start with something called a white wood, which is just a blank uh, board with ramps, and the designer of that game will fiddle for months over the exact placement of a ramp so that the shot up the ramp feels good. Um, one of the guys, Steve Ritchie, is called the king of flow because the games that he's designed have a, such a feeling to them when you shoot the ramp here as opposed to here. Um, and and they, they obsess over that. I believe they, they started around 1980. Um, if you look at the older games, they just don't have that, that extra level. They're now making a couple games that are deliberately retro. They're made with modern technology but they look like older games. Um, they just announced a, uh, a machine themed on the band Primus. So there's a Primus pinball machine, which is just a re-theming of a Pabst Blue Ribbon can crusher pinball machine, um, which are all just 
games made now meant to look like the 70s. Um, there's a great one, a really interesting one that actually won an award for best pinball machine a couple of years ago uh, made by Spooky Pinball called Total Nuclear Annihilation. I don't know if there's one of those downstairs, but it's an old style, there is, it's an old style game, no ramps, but it does have a little screen in the back box and like really much more modern lights and sound. It's, it's a really cool game um, with an interesting theme. Uh, other questions? Oh. And the soundtrack for that is amazing. The design is amazing. They did a really great job with that. Yes? My favorite and least favorite game? My favorite game is Twilight Zone, 1993, designed by Pat Lawler. It's, it's just a, it has so much packed into it. It's a wide body game. They had to make the game six inches wider just to fit all the toys. So many toys, I like the toys. That's, that's what I like. So I like the games from the 90s more than the ones from the 70s. Um, it's got uh, magna flip, these hidden magnets under the mini play field that will flip virtually. And they could do this in 93. It's got a ceramic pinball called the Powerball that, um, that, that comes out sometimes. It's got a clock, it's got a gumball machine. So that's my favorite. Least favorite, you know, that, so when I was um, in February, I gave a, a talk at the Austin Toy Museum in Texas. And, um, and the guy there, great, great folks there. They've got uh, a lot of old toys, lots of retro toys. You guys should go there. It's a small place, but it's really neat. Um, he said that he was restoring a pinball machine. And he'd be able to bring it out for the talk, and he did. And it was probably the most boring pinball machine I've ever played. It was called Dolphin. It was from, I think, 1960 or something, an old Wedgehead game with almost nothing to do. The games from the 60s are, are cool. They look beautiful, but a lot of times, at least for me, I feel like there's just not that much to do. I, I fell in love with pinball in the 90s. Um, and I found from these events that, that people fall into two camps. Either they fell in love with pinball in the 90s or in the 70s. And if it's the 70s people, the 90s games have too much going on. And if it's the 90s people, the 70s games are boring. Um, and that tends to be a pretty bimodal division. So yeah, maybe, maybe Dolphin. Yes? Uh, any pinball machines that can detect when you're tilting? You mean? Yeah, yeah. So, so it, it's a good question. The question is about the tilt mechanism in pinball machines, which is actually one of the most interesting parts of a pinball machine, because it's a physical device that looks exactly today like it did in 1935. That has not changed. So, in the 30s, they're trying to figure out a way to get people to stop bumping the machines. Um, and there's a story about Harry Williams, who was the founder of Williams Pinball who went to a drugstore to watch a guy playing one of his games, and the guy was just like lifting the machine and banging the machine and shaking the machine, and Harry Williams thought, this is a bad idea. I don't want people to be able to control these games and get whatever score they want, and it's bad for the machine to break the machine. He actually considered putting spikes under the game so that people couldn't lift it from the bottom. Uh, he did not do that, which is good, but um, he, he saw the, the person um, so he came up with a mechanism, a different mechanism than we have now. Imagine a little ball bearing on a golf tee, and if that ball bearing is knocked off that golf tee, it completes an electrical connection and the game shuts off. So that's what he put on that game. Um, when the game's done, the golf tee lowers and picks up the ball again. And he saw that player trying it again, the machine turned off, and the player said something like, oh look, I hit it and it tilted. And that's where he came up with the name tilt. So a tilt mechanism now looks a little different. It looks like, actually, it looks most like this microphone. Um, imagine a fishing weight hanging on a metal um, rod surrounded by a circle oh. like this gaff tape. Let's see. So imagine this is hanging here, and it just dangles there. And then if you shake the game enough, it completes the electrical connection by hitting the rod into the circle. The way most modern machines are set up, that will give you a tilt warning. So you get warning number one, warning number two, and the third time it shuts off, and that's the end of your ball. So that's the tilt mechanism from 1935 that they still use now. There's actually a second one in most pinball machines now called the slam tilt mechanism, and that's attached to the coin door, and a slam tilt mechanism prevents you from just bashing the hell out of the machine, like throwing it against the wall. So this is 
for jiggling the machine, which in competitive pinball is not only allowed, but everyone does it. And it's part of the game. The rule is, if the game lets you do it, lets you get away with it, you're allowed to do it. So sometimes they'll set the tilt really tight or they'll set it loose and they can do that based on how low or how high they put that weight. Um, if it's a really tight tilt, you may not be able to get away with much, but whatever the machine lets you get away with, you can do. And there are always tournaments where someone slams the hell out of it and it doesn't tilt and the whole audience watching goes, whoa, how'd you do that? So it's, uh, it is part of it. And a lot of pinball players have stories about how they went to some arcade and were moving the machine around a little bit and the owner got mad at them and there's some conflict there. No, I'm allowed to do this. No, you're not. Um, so yeah, it's, it's the same uh, now as it was in 1935, which is, which is kind of neat because as many advances as we've made in other parts of pinball, that one works just as it is. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, pinball map. Pinball map, yep. There are a couple others, pin finder, as I think one for the UK. Um, I forget the others, uh, but, but yeah, pinball map's the one I use. So I was just, um, yesterday, I was at Legoland in Florida with my kids. And after they went to sleep, I looked up, are there pinball places nearby? And there's a place called Arcade that had nine machines. It told me which ones they were. People update it so I can see this one's not working, this one has a weak left flipper. And um, if it weren't for the fact that my kids made me too sleepy, I would have gone there. But I wanted to go there. Yes. Great. So the question, um, and I have to repeat all the questions for the uh, the recording, so I hopefully don't find it obnoxious that I'm repeating your questions. So the question is, he's seen a pinball machine on a cruise ship. Where's the weirdest place I've seen a pinball machine? Um, you know, I I find pinball machines in random places. I somehow have like a radar for them, um, and it's annoying to my wife. Actually, everything about pinball is annoying to my wife. Um, but we'll be on vacation or something. We were in like... The, this little town in Belgium, and I somehow found this spot that had three pinball machines without the app, not even using the app. And then I have to sort of show her, like, look, there are three pinball machines, and I'm not going to play them. And I do that to get points from her. Um, weirdest place, uh, on a cruise ship is probably a bad idea. <laughs> because how do you, I mean, I've never been on a cruise, so I don't know how that works with the, with the what I would imagine it is a boat. Um, Weirdest place I've seen a pinball machine. I saw one, I guess it's more like I've seen them in arcades where I don't expect there to be an arcade. I had a, a flight from Munich to DC once that uh, realized mid-air they didn't have enough gas. And so they turned around over the Atlantic and went back and we had an emergency landing in Dublin. And so suddenly I've got a free night in Dublin on like a Sunday at 10 p.m. to do whatever I can for an hour in Dublin before Dublin shuts down. So I go right to downtown Dublin, and somehow my bus lets me off in front of this AWP, which is a, um, a European thing, apparently. It's amusement with prizes, which is kind of their quasi-gambling. And sure enough, there was a Metallica pinball machine there. And I played the game. I actually got a high score on the machine. And then nine months later, I was coincidentally in Dublin again, went to the same machine, and my initials were still on it. So that was kind of neat. I, haven't, I can't think of pinball machines I've seen in too many weird places. Um, anyone in the audience seen a pinball machine in a weird spot? I guess not, because it's, it's hard to do that. They're, they're really heavy and really expensive, and so you don't tend to just kind of leave them abandoned. You have? In a beach house where you stayed. Cool. Oh, actually, yeah, that's, that's another one. I was looking this up. I forget where, but I was someplace, and I was on the pinball map app. And this one place came up with like 20 pinball machines, and it turns out it was someone's Airbnb. And so if you stay in their Airbnb, you get to play in their arcade. So, so that, that was neat. Um, any other questions? If not, thank you again for coming. I'll be up here uh, for the next 20 minutes or so. If anybody would like to buy a book, they're $17. Um, if not, feel free to just come say hello. And uh, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day.